Browser Reading Group. Uh, I am Rachel, and today we're actually going to be reading a blog. I think this is the first. I think before we've always read, I've always read papers. Um, the blog is a blog version of a, uh, well, it says right here, uh, a tutorial at ACL 2020. So uh, tutorials are held with ACL conferences, and they are... Um, like little how to's or code alongs. No, shush. Sorry about that. Uh, I forgot to mute something. Um, I'm trying to remember the last tutorial that I took. It might have been. It might have been at Knackle in Austin in like 2016. I think I took a. Uh, computational social science tutorial. Don't quote me on that. Hi. Fair warning. I am not at full capacity today, I think I would say. Uh, also just, you know, like haven't been in a while. I don't think I'm alone in that. Uh, so let's get reading. Uh, the tutorial, the blog post is Common Sense Reasoning for Natural Language Processing. Uh, I'm sorry, I do know it's a little bit small on the screen. I can't make it bigger, unfortunately. Um, but please feel free to follow the link in the uh, uh, in the YouTube video description if you would like to see it a little bit bigger. And I will post it in Twitch as well. There you go. That's what we're reading. This long overdue blog post is based on the Common Sense tutorial ta taught by Martin Sapp, Antoine... Busule, Yijin Choi, Dan Roth, and myself at ACL 2020. Credit for much of the content goes to the co-instructors, but any errors are mine. Also, I think I said yesterday that Hal Dumay was one of the workshop presenters. It definitely wasn't. I was definitely um, incorrect about that. I'm going to turn that level down a little bit. A little bit peaky. In the last five years. Oh, and uh, Red is at... Um, the Allen Institute for Artificial Intelligence, I'm pretty sure that's where she is right now. Uh, let me just like double double check her, her Twitter to make sure I'm not saying wrong things. Yeah, she's at Allen AI. Um, and also uh, University of Washington, which is where I did my PhD. In the last five years, popular media has made it seem that AI is nearly, if not already, solved by deep learning. Uh, and I'm sure y'all have seen some of those various articles. The release of Google Translate's neural models in 2016 reported large performance improvements, 60% uh, reduction in translation errors on several popular language pairs. So that'll be the, um, the Transformer paper. Attention is all you need. Wait, 2016? No, that's a 2017 paper. Do a little, little mouse over. What is this? Archive. Okay, yeah, no, it is not the, the Boswani paper. It is Google's Neural Machine Translation System, Bridging the Gap Between Human and Machine Translation. I don't think I actually have read this. So, uh, 2016 paper. Uh, by looking under the hood, these numbers seem to be misleading. Neural models find shortcuts to the correct answers through data set specific input output correlations, especially essentially solving the data set, but not the underlying task. When models are challenged with adversarial out-of-domain examples, they perform poorly. So the models don't generalize very well. Small unnoticeable noise added to images confuses object recognition models and changes their predictions. Um, so there's been some like pretty scary stuff with um, adversarial examples for things like um, you know, computer vision correctly recognizing a stop sign, which would be important in, say, a self-driving car situation, um, where to a human it still looks like a stop sign, like the pixel manipulations are not noticeable. Um, but to a car, now it's like a duck. Visual question answering models guess the answer based on the frequency of answers for the same type of question in the training set. The training set, e.g. replying to, to any how many questions. Um, so there's like a fun... I don't know that they're really an experiment, but you will you ask like any question answering set. Um, hi, boy in Nepali, welcome to the stream. Uh, but there's a fun set of experiments, which I think is probably actually 
uh, this one, where if you ask any question answering system, how many giraffes are there in the, uh, in the picture, you will get a number even if there are no giraffes, and I think that's that paper. Image captioning models often learn to recognize objects based solely on their typical environment and fail to recognize them outside of their typical environment. In NLP, dialogue systems generate highly generic responses such as I don't know, even for simple questions. Yeah, that is definitely a, um, uh, a challenge in the field. Open-ended generation is prone to repetition. Question answering systems are easily distracted by the addition of an unrelated sentence to the passage and more. Um, so basically this is pulling together a bunch of different pieces of you know, research and system evaluation showing that uh, deep learning models um, understand is probably a poor word here, um, but deep learning models are really good at capturing the patterns in the specific data set that they were trained on, not so great at extrapolating to new things in a way that, you know, a biological learner probably would pretty well. Although that said, uh, dogs I, I have a dog, I've been working on a lot of training recently. Um, dogs don't adapt well to new contexts, so there's that aside. Hello, Jacques. I uh, hope you're having a nice morning in Kenya. Actually, that would be evening. Hope you're having a nice evening in Kenya. All right, uh, so a little example here of some adversarial scrolling there we go some adversarial uh, examples in computer vision and natural language processing um so here in object recognition you have uh, a picture of a giant panda and then this sort of pixel mask and the object recognizer no longer recognizes this giant panda visually to a human looks like a giant panda to uh the um deep learning system it now looks like a gibbon which is a type of monkey ape i think gibbons are apes I think it's a it's an ape. Anyway, not a panda. Uh, dialogue systems. How are you responding? I don't know. Uh, visual question answering. How many zebras are in the image? So here it's saying two, even though there are, to my eye, seven zebras in this image. This may or may not be a zebra. It's a little hard to tell. It's a bit grainy. Uh, and then for open-ended generation, getting I don't know, I don't know, I don't know, I don't know. Um, and if you've ever played with, um, you know. Uh, neural generation uh, models. This is really, really common. They all just get like repetitions of little snippets of text. Uh, and then image captioning. This says a horse standing in the grass, which is not the case. That is an alligator. I think that's an American alligator. Uh, and question answering. Uh, Nikola Tesla moved to Prague in 1880. Uh, Tadakatsu moved to Chicago in 1881. Where did Tesla move in 1880? And the system has been uh, fooled by this additional piece of information that is irrelevant to the question to say Chicago rather than Prague. Scroll. Scroll. There we go. Okay. Machine learning models today perform reasonably well on perception tasks, image and speech recognition. However, they mostly lack the ability to perform simple, intuitive, common-sense inferences that humans do in every minute of their waking hours regarding pre- and post-conditions of events, understanding other people's motivations and intents, mental and emotional states, etc. So, at this point uh, in the blog post, uh, neural networks really interesting, do a lot of cool things, you can see gains with them in specific tasks, but um, they don't do tasks in the way you would expect a human to, and they don't seem to have, you know, it, it would be uh, misleading to say that there's an understanding there, right? What is common sense? The boundaries of common sense are quite challenging to define, but we will go with this working definition. Common sense is the basic level of practical knowledge and reasoning concerning everyday situations and events that are commonly shared among most people. For example, it is common sense that it's okay to keep a closet door open, but not the fridge door as the food inside might go bad. So um, in order to know that, you need to know, right, that um, these are both doors, um, and even though they serve the same sort of general function, providing a separation between two spaces where that separation is removable, um, 
they serve different different practical functions and that a closet and a fridge are different things even though you know um they may look visually very similar um i don't know if y'all have ever seen like a kitchen where the the fridge is built into the wall so it looks like a cabinet um they can look extremely similar but they are different things and uh, common sense you know helps you understand that difference I don't know that I needed to like walk through that. That seems pretty straightforward. More coffee. <laughs> types of common sense. Common sense knowledge can be categorized according to types, including but not limited to social common sense. People are capable of making inferences about other people's mental state, e.g. what motivates them, what they are likely to do next, etc. This kind of inference is captured by the atomic knowledge base discussed later. In addition, we each have a set of social norms, not societal norms, and accepted behavior, e.g. knowing that it's impolite to comment on someone's weight. While these are often implicit in our actions and decisions, machines need to be taught them explicitly. Um, yeah, and I would say to a certain degree humans are taught those. Well, definitely some social norms are taught to humans explicitly by, you know, caregivers. Um, and others, I think, are, are picked up explicitly. So I think a good example of, you know, something that sort of, uh, you know, would be picked up implicitly without, like, direct um, instruction would be uh, if you're going to a new activity, right, you're going to go hang out with some people you haven't hung out with before, um, and you wear, you know, a certain set of clothes, and you get there and everyone is wearing, like, a certain different set of clothes, so maybe you wore something, you know, very colorful, and everyone else is wearing something not very colorful. Uh, maybe the next time you go hang out with that set of people, you choose to wear something less colorful, uh, because that seems to be what that group of people gravitates towards, um, and you would like to, you know, fit into this group for whatever reason. So that would just be, like, an example. Uh, temporal common sense. Natural language rarely communicates explicit temporal information. Instead, it's vague and relies on the common sense knowledge of the listener. For example, when told Dr. Porter is taking a vacation, we pr can predict that Dr. Porter will not be able to see us soon, as opposed to when Dr. Porter is taking a walk. This requires knowing the typical duration of taking a walk, minutes, and that of taking a vacation, days. Other temporal knowledge is typical times, order, frequency, etc. of events, which are addressed in the MC Taco dataset and the Taco LM time aware contextual language model. <clears throat> Interesting. Uh, physical common sense. Uh, I think in, this is uh, certainly in robotics, this is what gets talked about as common sense the most. A glass will likely shatter if it falls on the floor is a fact that most people, and arguably cats, know. Physical common sense includes knowledge about the physical properties and affordances of everyday objects as tested in the PICA dataset, P-I-Q-A. So different types of things that you need to know about the world as an agent acting independently or in a, in a social context. Common sense is essential for humans to navigate everyday situations. Oh, also, sorry, I have an aside. Um, so this, uh, this temporal common sense thing um, is much more ambiguous in English. I should say American English or, you know, standardized American English um, than it is in a lot of other languages. English has a very uh, lean... I think you could say, a uh, tense and aspect system, and other languages that have a much richer tense and aspect system, uh, that might, like, the the vacation is going to be a long time and the walk is going to be a short time might actually be, like, explicitly, um, uh, you know, encoded linguistically. So, just an aside, like, I know a lot of, uh, uh, Aboriginal languages of Australia have like a really rich tension aspect system um, that encodes a lot of a lot of temporal information in a way that we don't on verbs in, in American English. Common sense is essential for humans to navigate everyday situations seamlessly and interact with each other in a reasonable and safe way, and for AI to understand human needs and actions better. 
Yet, endowing machines with such human-like common-sense reasoning capabilities has remained an elusive goal of AI research for decades. Past attempts in the 1960s and 70s resulted in an AI winter, i.e. reduced interest and funding for AI research due to failed, overhyped research directions. Hmm. Overhyped research directions, you say. In recent years, new interest in machine common sense has emerged with the availability of stronger computing power and huge amounts of data. With that said, the path to machine common sense is unlikely to be brute force training larger neural networks with deeper layers. So I think this is something that is maybe not entirely obvious to someone who, um, you know, is fairly new to machine learning or really only has a deep learning background um, that you might not like. I think a general trend in the field is that most tasks where people are building bigger models and using more data seem to see an improvement. Um, and I would say that there's sort of a latent variable there, which is that people are only really investing in data sets and bigger models for things where that's likely to actually make an improvement, right? There's a little bit of selection bias in terms of what tasks are exciting. So like language modeling in, you know, in 2017, in 2015, um, language modeling was definitely not like a hot topic. Uh, and now it is. And I think a big part of that is that it's been reframed in a way that, um, you know, it is doable as a deep learning problem. Period. Let's say in that sense. Uh, Ashay says, can social norms be considered uh, biases in human decision making? Possibly. I think that's a, that's a separate research question. I would say here social norms is more, what is the social information that I expect us to share, right? So like, um, I don't know, uh, a, a good example is... Um, I'm trying to come up with something around handshakes and I no longer remember what handshakes are. No, that's not true. Um, like when is it appropriate to shake hands? Right. So, um, just like using a historical example, like it would be perfectly appropriate. Well, maybe not right now. Well, that, that's a good one. Like right now, you know, it's not really appropriate to be close to people who you don't live with, uh, because of the, you know, the risk of contagion. Um, whereas, you know, this time two years ago, it would have been perfectly acceptable to, to, to offer my hand a shake. And now it would be like, whoa, <laughs> that's extremely presumptuous and a little bit rude. Uh, so yeah, I, biases play a part, but I would say that like, that's a slightly different question. Coffee. <sighs> Hi, Eldon. <laughs> um, is common sense net language is common sense knowledge already captured by pre-trained language models? Um, and I think that this, uh, so remember we read the paper with Emily Bender and her co-author on it that I do not remember the co-author's name. Sorry about that. I barely remember my own name today. I'm very tired in the, I was going to say in, in the body, but I'm not sleepy. I'm just like, mentally exhausted um where uh i think uh emily and, and her co-author co definitely argued no and i think here uh Brett's gonna argue yes kind of in the last few years language models have been ubiquitous in nlp language models are pre-trained once in a self-supervised manner that requires only a large text corpus Traditionally, language models are trained to predict the next word in a sentence, top part of figure two in blue, but they can also pre predict hidden masked words in the middle of a sentence, as in Google's BERT model. This pre-training phase yields a function that gets a sequence of words, sentence, short paragraph, and returns a vector for each word in the sentence. So with the example here, um, the language model for pre-training, Parrots, parrots are among the most intelligent birds, and the ability of some species to imitate human speech enhances their popularity as blank, and then the blank should be filled in with pets. And then a masked, so uh, traditionally language models predict the next word, masked language models predict the middle word, a word in the middle. So masked language models, parrots are among the most intelligent blank, here to be filled in with birds, and the ability of some species to imitate human speech enhances their popularity as pets. And then the fine tuning, once they've been pre-trained um, input, you have a pre-trained language model, a classifier, an output. Uh, the loss is used to update the pre-trained language model. Um, 
and also like the the label so like you look at a label you see if it's right and if it's not you change the model as opposed to word embedding beddings which are static language based model word language model based word vectors are dynamic and recomputed for each context at the very basic level, they assign different vectors to words when they are used in different senses, as in figure 3. Sense is the technical term here. I'm using both the keyboard and mouse. The cat chased away the mouse. So one is, you know, this. The other one is um, an animal. Static. Uh, I am, so here you can see that the vectors are different, uh, and here the vectors are the same. So I'm using both the keyboard and the mouse, and a cat chased away the mouse. Do off-the-shelf pre-trained language models already capture common sense knowledge? Ye point in the yes column, they are capable to some extent of filling incomplete common sense facts or ranking candidate facts. For example, the language model score approximate statement plausibility of a fact like a musician plays a musical instrument is higher than a dancer plays a musical instrument. So this is the, um, you know, the probability of a sequence given the the training corpus um, and it would be higher for this statement than this statement. Uh, Arshad says, don't use this UI, the paper window looks too small and the UI takes most of the space. Yeah, I know it's a bit small. Um, the big problem is when I zoom in on this paper, it is not uh, dynamic, unfortunately. Uh, but the link to the paper is in um, the YouTube video link if you would like to, to scroll along. Uh, so that's one a piece of evidence that um, language models, model co-occurrence, um, which can capture some evidence, can capture some things that correlate with facts. They can, to some extent, associate concepts with their properties. They distinguish concepts associated with a given set of properties, i.e. complete a statement such as a blank has fur, is big, has claws, has teeth, is an animal, with bear, just like playing the 20 question game. They perform better when they are shown encyclopedic properties, e.g. is an animal, as opposed to perceptual properties, smooth. Um, I was going to be like, uh, so one of these things is more likely to be written down than the other. Um, and I was going to be like, bears are smooth, but people don't talk about it. Bears aren't smooth. They're like, I don't know. I've never touched a bear, and I hope never to. But looking at them, they don't look smooth. Uh, they can also pretty successfully list the properties associated with given concepts, e.g. complete a sentence. Everyone knows that a bear has blank, fur, claws, and teeth. So again, these are probabilistic models of sequences, uh, of tokens, in this case words. Well, actually, if this is Bert, not words, uh, Bert uses um, word piece tokens. Um... Where was I in the paper? Um, so yes, by doing the job that language models do, they can, to some extent, capture pieces of information or reflect pieces of information that were shown in the original training data. However, language models, knowledge generated from language models is noisy. Several papers have shown that language models are not sensitive to negation. <laughs> i.e. they consider the negated version of facts. Birds can't fly as similarly possible. So I was saying that it's equally likely that birds can't fly and birds can fly. And while some birds don't or cannot fly, the majority of birds are, you know, I would say for most people, exemplified by their ability to fly. Uh, and they're sensitive to phrasing. So sentence, the sky is blank today, as opposed to today, the sky is blank. Um, so for this first example, the top prediction is blue. And for this other example, the top prediction is clear. Um, and well, uh, both are, I think, you know, fairly reasonable. The fact that simply, um, you know, an equivalent syntactic, sorry, an equi semantically equivalent um, input with a different syntactic structure changes the output, which is good evidence that they are not capturing, you know, the most likely state of affairs for the sky, right? 
in distributional word, sorry, so in theory, syntax and semantics should be separate, right? So the mostly separate. So the structure of um, a piece of language output should be independent from its meaning. You know, with, with with some differences like negation. So I should be able to like, you know, take the the syntactic skeleton of a of a sentence and uh, plop it down with you know different different words to give it different meanings, and it still should share the same structure. And the fact that these are sensitive to structure um, in a way that changes the output, even though the two things should be like meaning equivalent, um, is not what you want from a knowledge system. In distributional word vectors, the vector representation, a subword, is learned from the context in which it appeared, leading to similar representations for semantically similar words. In language models, the representation of similar contexts is similar, so the model learns which type of word it should appear should appear next, or instead of a mass token. This is generally a positive thing, but sometimes it overgeneralizes. Um, so uh, in vector space, words with similar usage occur next to each other. Sometimes this correlates with meaning um, and uh, this overgeneralization. And this is used to overgeneralize, overgeneralize from a category to a specific example that is not super uh, correct, <laughs> I would say. So in this example, the color of the dove was blank. Uh, the top predictions are red, different, golden, black, and blue. Uh, doves are usually gray or white. Um, I'm sure they come in different colors. I think there's like some tropical doves that are like iridescent blue. Um, but red is not a very canonical color for doves. Is there a red dove? Maybe. Would I say that, you know, <laughs> it's the most common color for doves? No. Here, BERT has seen in its uh, training corpus enough sentences of the type, the color of something is color, to know, uh, to know, so this is something from the class color, to know to suggest different colors as substitutes for the masked words. Unfortunately, not every color ball is suitable in every context that calls for color. BERT likely didn't see enough sentences discussing the color of a dove, thus it just defaults to predicting any color. So this is not knowledge, this is like SAT. <laughs> Uh, prep strategies, basically, guessing because you don't know. Uh, so knowledge in language models is not the most accurate and reliable. Is it still useful? Yes, to some extent. One way to show it is through evaluation on tasks requiring common sense knowledge. We will discuss several such tasks, but for now let's focus on the Winograd as an example. Grand. Winograd. In the large scale version, it is the large scale version of the Winograd schema challenge, or schema challenge. Give it a sentence with a close. The goal is to fill the blank with a previously mentioned concept or entity uh, out of two answer choices. For example, because Brett found an internship while in college, but Ian was unable to, blank found a job less quickly out of, after graduation. So this should be um, Ian instead of Brett because Ian got the internship, is the, the assumption given the, um, the situation. Um, uh, a close is a blank. So um, the, the the mask task that Bert does is also known as a closed tasks. C-L-O-Z-E, that is not a typo. Uh, should I keep phrasing the same for any specific question as that might not be possible for large data sets? What are your thoughts on this? Um, I mean, I guess it depends on your, your context. I would say if you're doing something like a dialogue agent, uh, specifically with Raza, uh, you should provide as many examples with different phrasing as possible in your training data so that the assistant is more able to handle those sort of general um, things. Um, yes, so I would say in general diversity in phrasing is good, uh, particularly if you have uh, a language with a less fixed syntactic order than English, which is like honestly most of them. English is, they're, they're sort of like a uh, a gradient of we keep grammatical information in like little word pieces that we stick onto things and we keep grammatical information in the order that things are in. English is very, very much on the, the order side of that scale. Um, most languages are more on the, you know, order is pretty important, but we use a lot of little language pieces or like order, meh, we mostly use little language pieces. Um, so like Russian, a word order is like very unimportant and um, syntactic, not sorry, morphological structure, like little word pieces are much more important. Um, yeah. 
uh, Shay says this might cause the questions to be similar between two or more intents. So uh, I think a, a good rule of thumb is, uh, for me, is if there's a lot of overlap in tokens between two intents um, and they are not function words, this is a little bit of a little bit of a tangent, but I think it's a good question. Um, so function words are, you know, things like in, um, of, and the things that are in English likely to occur in sort of any set of sentences and are very common in the language overall. If you have a lot of those that overlap between two categories, don't worry about it. Um, if you have uh, a lot of rare words that overlap between categories, for example, you know, you have two intents and you're placing an order for different things, those should probably be one intent. Um, and I have a video that'll be coming about this when it's done, hopefully Monday, that's my plan. Um, yeah, so that's my, my general, um, guidance there. Um, yes. So yes, definitely rephrasing. And if rephrasing starts to make two intents very, very similar, um, then I think that they're probably maybe too similar and it might be worthwhile to combine them. And then um, if you need to tell them apart, like the thing that you're ordering, use entity extraction or slots for that instead would be my recommendation. Hopefully that helps. Choo -choo. Uh, what makes this task, the, the Winograd task, exceptionally difficult is that for every instance, is that every instance has a twin sentence, which is minimally changed, such the correct answer is the other one. For instance, replacing less quickly with more quickly will change the correct answer from Ian to Brett. Language beast models top the leaderboard of language model based models top the leaderboards of Winograd and other common sense tasks, but since they are trained on task-specific training data, which often contains tens or hundreds of thousands of training examples, it's hard to attribute the success to the knowledge captured in language models from the pre-training step. A better way to estimate it is with zero-shot unsupervised models. Uh, the um, GPT-3 paper is all about zero-shot. Typically, the way zero-shot models address multiple choice tasks is by phrasing the statement from the instance and each answer choice and computing the language model score as a proxy for possibility, so the probability of the whole sequence for each of the answers. Uh, thanks. You're welcome. Um, I hope that helped. And then predicting the answer choice with the best language model score, highest probability, which is usually computed, computed as the lowest perplexity, uh, which is an information theoretic measure that if you're not comparing language models, you probably don't need to know about. In our recent EMNLP paper, we take it one step further and ask whether we can use language models to generate what would otherwise be missing or implicit knowledge needed for solving a multiple choice common sense answering instance. We propose the unsupervised self-talk framework that uses language models to generate information-seeking questions such as what is the definition of blah 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 and their corresponding answers, clarifications, to discover additional background knowledge. In the example in figure 5, knowing that internship experience might help a person get a job is crucial for answering the question, which of Brett and Ian found a job less quickly? On most benchmarks, the self-talk model performed better than unsupervised models with no additional knowledge, while competing with models that have access to knowledge bases. Uh, those are formalized uh, data sets. Those are formal data sets where the relationship between words and their you know, meanings is um, annotated by hand, basically. Uh, this is despite WordNet. What I call WordNet a knowledge base? Yes, maybe. I would look at their docs and see if they call themselves a knowledge base. Oh no, my mouse. This is despite the inaccurate and noisy knowledge language models generate. However, when we showed people some of the clarifications that helped the model choose the correct answer choice, they judged only 40% of them as actually providing helpful information. This discrepancy means that our human that our model doesn't imitate human reasoning process. It works differently. Check out our demo. It's not always accurate, but it's often funny. Five smiley face. So something to, to check out. Um, so what they're saying, 
This makes sense to me because uh, by including additional information in your prompt, um, you are likely to get sort of an area of the, the language model vector space that is closer to the specific thing that you're looking at. Um, so it makes sense to me that that would help. Um, it is also not surprising to me that it is not reasoning in a human-like way. Which again is not, like, I think a fundamental flaw of these models. That's not what they're designed for. So here is the figure. Scroll on in. Scroll, scroll, scroll. Uh, question generation. Because Brett found an internship while in college, but Ian was unable to, Blank found a job less quickly after graduation. Um, and then there's a little prefix. What is the purpose of blank? The purpose of blank is. Um, so this is what they're asking the language model to generate. Um, so they're filling in what is the purpose of the internship? Uh, the purpose of the internship is help people find jobs. Um, so this is an example of the clarification and then filling in the, uh, the sentence was more, or answering the question, uh, was more successful. The best performance on common sense tasks is achieved by fine tuning language models, i.e. training them on task specific data. Let's look at some of the benchmarks and issues we faced with supervised learning. How to measure common sense reasoning capabilities. Coffee. Multiple common sense benchmarks have been released over the last few years. Some of them will be discussed here. See examples in figure six, along with the main differences and design choices when creating a benchmark. So these are different, um, usually a benchmark will include both a data set and a specific task that you're supposed to do with that data set. Um, and the examples here are COPPA, choice of possible alternatives. Uh, context, the man broke his toe, question, what was the cause? And the choices are, he got a hole in his sock, not the correct answer, and he dropped a hammer on his foot, the correct answer. Common sense QA, where on a river could you hold a cup upright to catch water on a sunny day? Choices, waterfall, bridge, valley, pebble, and mountain, and the answer is waterfall. And I think the reason they say sunny day here is so that it's not um, implied that it is raining, or you cannot infer that it might be raining. Uh, Winograd, Katrina had the financial means to afford a new car, while Monica did not, since blank had a high paying job. So Katrina uh, would be the answer there. MC Taco, multiple choice temporal common sense. Contents, Contents, dot, 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 dream of becoming a judge. Question, how many years did it take for Mark to become a judge? 63 years, seven weeks, seven years, seven seconds, and seven hours. So you just sort of have to like know how long it takes to become a judge roughly. Um, and I guess 63 years is too long to become a judge and the rest of the answers are not years. I don't know that much about law careers. Uh, maybe 63 years is reasonable. I get a sense that being a judge is sort of something that happens later in your career usually, but I'm, again, don't know a lot about law careers. Uh, social IQA, social interaction QA, question answering here, QA. Uh, in the school play, Robin played a hero in a struggle, in the struggle, blank, 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 angry villain. How would others feel as a result? Sorry for the villain, hopeful that Robin will succeed, and like Robin should lose the fight. Uh, and probably hopeful that Robin will succeed because he's playing a hero and he's struggling against a villain and he would want the hero to win. And then Pika, physical interaction, question answering. Uh, to separate egg whites from the yolk using a water bottle, you should, and the choices are release, which creates suction and lifts the yolk. I don't know if you've ever seen this, but it's like a little, you, know, you hold a, you crack an egg on a plate, you hold, you know, something flexible with a, you know, orifice over it, a water bottle, you squeeze the water bottle, you put it over the egg yolk, you release the water bottle, and it sucks the yolk up into the bottle. I think you can buy like specific gadgets for it. Uh, it is not the easiest way to separate egg yolks, but it is like a fun science experiment to show, show you know, the uh, vacuum properties. Um, and the correct choice is to release the water bottle, which creates suction and lifts the yolk, and the incorrect choice is to keep pressing, which creates suction and lifts the yolk, because continuing to press would uh, not create suction, it would do the opposite of that. 
So those are some examples of the common sense uh, benchmarks and the different things you have to do. And it looks like they are all multiple choice questions, which I will say is, mm, I understand why you're doing that for, a, you know, multiple choice, why you're doing that for a benchmark, because that's fairly easy to evaluate. But I would say the majority of cases where you have, you know, multiple choice stuff that <laughs> you're but the majority of cases when you're building a system that has to do with common sense stuff it is not multiple choice right like it's it's more of a fill in the blank sort of thing or free answer uh and then sort of a discussion of the different types of uh the different qualities of the data set and I'm trying to decide how far down I want to read today, probably to, to this part where we start talking about how to enhance neural networks, and then we can do that next week, and I'll try to figure out how I can get stuff bigger. Uh, we read that. Okay, so what is different between these different types of benchmarks? One, type of knowledge. Some benchmarks focus on a specific type of common sense knowledge, such as social common sense, physical common sense, temporal common sense, or causes and effects. Copa, uh, while others target a broader domain of general common sense knowledge and reasoning. Um, so how much your model needs to know, and uh, I don't know, I don't like to talk about models knowing things. Um, it's just, I think it's a little, it's very tempting to draw parallels between a system that does something that humans do and humans doing that same task. Um, but I think that that is a little bit of a dangerous rabbit hole to fall down because it will give you unrealistic expectations of the behavior of that system. Um, and in some cases may give you very unrealistic expectations in a way that causes you to make poor choices and to deploy it where it shouldn't be deployed. General, general warning. Uh, size. Most recent data sets include a large training set in order to facilitate training large neural models little bit unrealistic. Sometimes you have it, usually you don't. One way to create a benchmark is to hire experts to curate a high quality data set, such as for uh, WSC, the Wino Grad Corpus, and COPA. These data sets are rather expensive to collect, <laughs> understatement, and are therefore typically small. The common alternative is to create data through crowdsourcing or semi-automatically and split it randomly to train validation and test sets. Models that learn data-specific shortcuts in the training set instead of generalized phenomena are likely to perform well on a test set drawn from the same distribution, but this performance is misleading and is likely a lot better than on real-world instances of the task, so it's overfit to the, you know, the distribution of the training data. Despite this understanding, this is still the dominant approach. Um, and I would say crowdsourcing also has some other pretty big drawbacks. Um, like, a, a big one is sort of like the research um, ethics standpoint because a lot of times the the pay for oh so there's a thing in research ethics where you cannot pay people significantly more than you know other people would for doing something similar uh, because then it pr produces an incentive for them to continue doing the tasks maybe even when they don't want to so it's hard to maintain conformed consent informed consent rather um, but the problem is that crowdsourcing pays you know very little <laughs> to the people who are actually doing the crowdsourcing, which, um, you know, makes it cost effective, but not like great as work. Um, and if you try to pay, you know, a reasonable you know, living wage, honestly, for anywhere in the world, um, then you'll run into like ethics problems because suddenly you're paying a lot more than other people on the same platform. Uh, so you can't really pay people like a reasonable amount to do this, this task, like as much as you would pay like undergrads you got to come into a lab and, and do the same thing um and also the the quality varies tremendously and the amount of hand very hand validation that goes on in the data sets varies tremendously and there are like even some pretty well-known data sets have some very poor quality data in them for language data sets that might be like you know abusive language nonsensical language um you know, anyway, just something to think about. Uh, Ashley says, do some benchmarks include answering uh, multiple MCQ for passage questions? How do the models perform on that? Yeah, actually, I think um, there's some data sets out of um, LNAI for that. Uh, a lot of them are taken from standardized tests. And I think it's, let's see if I can find it. Uh, LNAI. 
I'm trying to remember what the specific benchmark I'm thinking of. Um, I think it's like the middle school science benchmark. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The uh, AI science uh, questions B two one. So this event's actually a little bit, a little bit older. But this is um, there you go. So it's um. You know, it's a middle school science quiz, basically. Um, so what information is contained in this map of the US? There's a picture of the US and uh, I can't continue to zoom in. Um, and it's got weather information on it. And then you need to pick weather conditions. And I don't know that they actually have like the bench, like the, the, the data here. Um, evaluation. They've built the system for doing it. Mm. Yeah, I would say like, okay is sort of generally where we are for, for answering passage questions. I, I would not say that it's like, well, it's not a solved problem if, if that's what you're asking. I would say very few problems in NLP are solved. Um, and actually, I don't know that that's a good goal, right? I, I think a good goal is a robust enough, explainable enough, fair enough system that works that you can use it for what you need to do and that it's has, you know, it's clear why it's failed and when it will fail and you can give people realistic expectation of model performance. Um, I, I, like, I, I honestly don't know that language is like solvable in the way that, you know, a game is because it's just so complex, so multifaceted, changing so quickly um, and so diverse that I, I think that's a it's a fool's errand. All we can all we can aim for is to to know more about it and to to build better things. Um, SAT packages passages, yeah. The um, I don't know. ETS might have something. So the SAT is uh, an American standardized test for um, college entry. There, there's a couple. The SAT is the biggest one. And it's done by um, Educational Testing Services, ETS, which is a private company. And they are pretty... Um, conservative when it comes to you know, data security, because they're trying to prevent cheating, obviously. Perhaps obviously. Um, they're trying to prevent cheating, so I don't know that the SAT questions would be, like, available. But yes, there, are, there is at least one data set, and you could probably find more with a little bit more digging. Uh, doo -doo -doo. Size. Crowdsourcing. That's when I got completely off, off, uh, off track. Format. The vast majority of data sets are in the format of multiple choice questions as exemplified in figure six. This format is the easiest to evaluate automatically. Models are judged for their accuracy, i.e. what percent of the questions they answered correctly. Unfortunately, this type of task also makes it possible for a model to guess the correct answer. We're not talking about a random guess, which would leave enough room for improvement. A random guess is expected to convey result in an accuracy of 100 divided by k, where k is the number of answer questions, e.g. 50% accuracy for binary tests, 33.3% for tests with three choices, 25% with tests for four choices, etc. The risk is... Uh, that the model makes an educated guess based on, yes, you guessed it correctly, spurious correlations between the questions and the correct, incorrect answers. Um, so, again, this is sort of like a strategy where you teach people, like, to know about how people write multiple choice quests, ch ch tests, so that they can sort of do well on them, as opposed to understanding the information so that they can answer the question because they know the right answer. Uh, how do you make sure the model is right for the right reasons? That's the million dollar question. We don't have a perfect solution for this problem yet. For a start, when collecting a new benchmark, the process of collecting incorrect answers, distractors, should be well designed such that distractors are plausible but unlikely. Using random answers as distractors, e.g. naturally occurring sentences or correct answers of different questions, would create topically different distractors, which are easy to detect. Remember, relatedness is one of the strengths of distributional text representations. So if your question is about like amphibians and one of the answers is about amphibians and the rest are about reptiles, it'll probably be fairly easy for the uh, like just like a word vector approach to do pretty well. 
Asking people to come up with the distractors may introduce other annotation artifacts, such as exaggerating, going off topic, or producing overly emotional texts, which are easy for models to detect. Some solutions have been proposed. For example, the distractors in the social IQA are answers for different questions asked in the same context. In Figure 7, the context, Alex spilt food all over the floor and it made a huge mess, appears in the dataset with two questions, what happens next and what happened before. The distractors of what happens next are the correct answers of what happened before, e.g. that Alex had slippery hands. A similar approach is taken in Common Sense QA. Um, so here, let me zoom in. Uh, the original question, Alex spelt food all over the floor and it made a huge mess. What happens next? What will Alex want to do next? Correct answers, mop it up, give up, and order takeout. Incorrect answers, have slippery hands, get ready to eat. These are the things that happened before and not what happened next. An alternative solution is to figure out easy questions through adversarial filtering, i.e. training a weaker model and iteratively removing instances that it succeeds in answering. Variants of adversa adversarial filtering were applied to Winograd and Pika. Finally, I believe the future is in generative tasks, in which the model needs to produce a free text answer without being provided with the candidate answers, which I think is very reasonable. And that's, um, I don't know, when I was teaching um, linguistics, I uh, preferred like really short essay questions. Like I'd have students do like low stakes free writing to sort of assess their understanding. And I think like that works much better for a teacher to understand where students are than a multiple choice quest question, but obviously does not scale. Um, so I think that this is a really, uh, really cool way of approaching the problem that I think makes sense given the sort of drift in the field towards more and more generative models. Several recent, recent benchmarks are generative, such as time travel, counterfactual reasoning, art, uh, abductive reasoning. I don't know what abductive reasoning is. Let me look it up. Uh, counterfactual reasoning is, um, factual would be like, this is what is. Counterfactual would be like, if it were not thus, then what? Abductive. It's reasoning that moves away from the sagittal plane. <laughs> Sorry, that's abduction. Uh, that's not the answer I found when I looked it up. I'm just... Uh, yeah, pop up ye olde Wikipedia. Uh, abductive reasoning is a form of logical inference, uh, blah, 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 blah. It starts with an observation or set of observations and then seeks to find the simplest and most likely conclusion from the observations. This process, unlike deductive reasoning, yields a plausible conclusion but does not positively verify it. Okay, so that's sort of like, um, uh, there's a... Uh, you know, some like cognitive um, assessment tests where like you're shown a, a picture of a situation and like, what happens next? Um, I think are used for like dementia, maybe? I don't know. I We briefly talked about them in a class where we talked about psychology a little bit and that's where I am on those, but I know they exist. Uh, common Gen and Proto QA. The challenges in generative tasks is the lack of reliable automatic evaluation metrics. Yeah, that is the problem. Um, evaluating text generation in general is very difficult. Given the gold standard reference answers, we would like a metric to one, reward correctly generated answers that are different from the reference answer, so you can't use something like blue, which I, I know somebody out there was like, oh, what about blue? Uh, well, two, penalizing incorrect answers that are similar, e.g. lexically, to the reference. Again, blue will not work for this because that is a measure of overlap. Human evaluation is reliable, but it is costly and is typically done once on the test set. In order to be able to provide, so you can't do like, um, um, you can't like use the loss to update your model without having some sort of human in the loop. In order to be able to improve models during development, we need automatic metrics. I mean, you can use human uh, evaluation, but it is way slower. We currently settle for metrics based on lexical overlap, such as blue and rouge, which are pretty terrible at one, and have little correlation with human judgments, or model-based metrics such as BERT score that are not great at two. Um, so having penalizing uh, things that are factually incorrect, but lexically similar. So um, one of the sort of big dangers of these large language models is that they will generate plausible fluent text that is just straight up factually incorrect. Um, 
and that's okay in some contexts, but definitely not in a context where you, you want true things to be said. All right, how to, I'm gonna see. Yeah, I think we can get through this last section. My voice is going a little bit, but I think we got it. How to gather and represent machine readable common sense knowledge. Common sense resources provide machine readable knowledge about the world. Resources are expected to be large scale and accurate, consist of diverse knowledge types and be usable in downstream tasks. ConceptNet is a large 21 million assertions commonly used resource consisting of general common sense knowledge in over 85 languages. Atomic, <laughs> Atomic consists of 880 thousand triplets reasoning about causes and effects of everyday solutions situations other resources are listed in figure eight um, so these are uh different resources uh in in different research lines so this cyc i don't know how that would be said psych i guess uh like cycle um has several iterations, uh, Open Mind Common Sense, and then ConceptNet, which is the one I think I have heard about before, Nell, WebChild, and then Atomic. Uh, representation. How is knowledge represented in the resource? ConceptNet and Atomic represent knowledge in natural language, figure nine, while Nell and Psych, I guess, represent knowledge in symbolic logic. Here is the, the symbolic logic, so implies and is a object subset uh, generalizes, I guess, uh, superset subset, and then is a object subset. So this is uh, an annotation for, for symbolic logic. Man, it's been a while since I, actually it hasn't been that long since I, I use symbolic logic, but it's been a while since it was the main thing I was doing. It was never the main thing I was doing. I did take, uh, I did do some stuff with it in grad school. So, Example, knowledge extracted from ConceptNet and Atomic, uh, from, from Martin Sapp. Uh, so Tony's grandma was reading a new book when she dropped her glasses. So reading is a type of relaxing. It's a type of ed, uh, ap activity. Glasses are used for reading. Glasses are a type of corrective lens and glasses are capable of improving one's vision. So using this, you can tell, uh, perhaps that, uh, she will no longer be able to read her book. She couldn't pick them up, so she yelled for Tom to help. Uh, help is used for people. So all of this yellow here is for ConceptNet, and then the green here is for Atomic. Uh, Tom rushed to help her, look for them, then heard a loud crack. Then Tom realized, they realized that Tom broke her glasses by stepping on them. Promptly, his grandma yelled at Tom to get her new pair. So uh, she called Tom for help. Tom rushed to help her. Why will? Uh, they heard a loud crack. X feels nervous. X here being both of them, I guess? Or maybe the grandma? So there's an X and a Y, and I think those each correspond to one of the people. Uh, they realized that Tom broke her glasses by stepping on them. Tom broke her glasses. Tom will want to get her a new pair. His grandma yelled at Tom. X wanted, his grandma wanted to express anger. So this is sort of, um, relationships between um, pieces of text and, and what's happening in the concept that is this relationship of um, you know things and their their properties uh, is concept net the Berkeley one I think concept net is the Berkeley one concept net consists of semantic knowledge ie properties of concepts eg reading as a type of activity Atomic, on the other hand, is inferential. Given a templated events with person X representing the subject and person Y and optional objects, e.g. person X yells at person Y. Oh, I should have read this first. That's much clearer. I thought that these were variables assigned to individuals, but instead it's a subject-object thing, which is about uh, position in the sentence and um, relationship to the conjunction of the verb. Uh, and one of the nine predefined relation dimensions, e.g. person X's motivation, it provides a second event, e.g. person X wanted to express anger. Collection method. Knowledge can be collected from humans, either experts or crowdsourcing workers. Expert curated resources are more uniform and accurate and may use complex representations, but is it, a, it is an expensive collection method and is very time consuming. Alternatively, non-experts can write knowledge in natural language, making the collection faster and more scalable. 
but harder to avoid these, uh, these curious correlations. The alternative approach is to extract knowledge automatically from text, as in NEL. This approach works, but produces less accurate knowledge. In addition, the approach suffers from reporting bias, over-representing the rare at the expense of the trivial. So this is the, the black swan problem. For example, people are reported to murder more often than they are reported to breathe, even though breathing happens more often. Default properties of concepts, yellow banana, are mentioned less often than their alternatives, green banana, etc. So the black swan problem is that um, there are more discussions of black swans than white swans, even though white swans are more common because humans tend to talk about things that are rare and not talk about things that are, you know, super uh, com common. <laughs> All right, let's call it there. I am, I think I've used about as much brain as I have right now. Uh. So, just a quick recap, recap to where we have gotten so far. Um, are we there with common sense? No. We have some sort of lossy approximation of common sense, but it's not, you know, it's not there yet. We got a long way to go. Common sense can be a number of different things. It can be social knowledge. It can be temporal knowledge. It can be physical knowledge about the world and, and the way things work. Um, there are a, a lot of existing common sense tasks. Most of them are multiple choice. There are some tasks that are uh, working with um, generation instead, but the big problems with generation are that you can't use it for automated evaluation to do, for example, uh, you know, back propagation the way that you know most uh, neural networks work pretty well with. Uh, so the lack of an automated metric makes it harder uh, to, to evaluate those, even though they are perhaps a better yardstick of where the models actually are. And uh, gathering and representing common sense knowledge in a machine readable way is um, hard. You can either do it solely with experts and have high quality annotations that are hard, or you can do it much faster with crowdsourcing in a way that is um, you know, less high quality, uh, or you can try to extract information from text, knowledge from text, which is again very difficult um, and has, you know, lots of problems as we just mentioned. So uh, we'll pick back up next week at this time on Thursday um, with how to add neural models, how to add common sense uh, symbolic knowledge to neural models is what we'll talk about next time and then and then finish off the blog post. Um, I think it's, it's a little bit of a definitely a high level, a little bit of a, a whirlwind through the, the research, but hopefully helpful for folks. Um, and definitely, I think uh, I have enjoyed reading it, even though I am tired, <laughs> very, very tired. Um, so thank you for joining today. We will be back tomorrow with um, live coding and it'll actually be a walkthrough, a code walkthrough of Araza Assistant, um, which I had a, had a request for. So um, yeah, that'll be tomorrow, same time, 9 a.m. Pacific. Um, I'll see you then and have a great day.